People have a legacy of changing the world around them, sometimes for the better, but oftentimes for the worse. In the mid 1800s, settlers from the eastern United States brought with them brook trout, a memento reminding them of home. Not only did the brook trout thrive, they endangered countless native trout species such as the Lahontan cutthroat and California state fish, the golden trout. But thanks to new conservation efforts, federal, state, and independent organizations are working to return native fish habitats to their original conditions. The programs have seen success, but much work still lies ahead. My film partner Zach and I felt it vital to document the progression and regression of these fish through hands-on experience, as well as acquiring the imperative knowledge from those who pay forward some of this progress themselves. We left Southern Oregon for the Sierra Nevadas to witness these trout in their native habitats and find out what remains. My name is Caden. And I'm Zach. And we're both students attending Southern Oregon University. We both have a passion for the outdoors and conservation, so we decided to make a film dedicated to the native fish of the West Coast. In late August, we packed all of our camera and camping gear into the tundra and started our journey to find these fish in their native habitats. We made our way to a campground seated in the middle of the Eastern Sierras, hoping to see one of the world's most beautiful trout the next day. In the morning, we packed our bags and prepared for the longest hike of the trip. Today, we would cover eight miles with nearly 2,500 feet of elevation gain to reach a lake that's sitting over 10,000 feet. We got a late start on the hike and arrived at the trailhead around noon. With our bodies still acclimating to the high elevation, we were not yet prepared for the mountainous terrain that light ahead. This is the main creek right here, and I seen a really nice pool. And I seen, a, I seen, I think it was a brookie or a rainbow came to the surface and ate uh, a caddis fly. So uh, I'm gonna rig up an ant pattern and flick it right in there, see if we can't catch him. It's right there, going in front of the rock. There we go. Oh, let me grab my net. <laughs> We got it. <laughs> it's a brook trout. Yeah. Brook trout are actually non-native and they're pretty invasive all across the West where we have our native cutthroats or even our native red band rainbows. And they also breed in the fall, which is a little different than our native trout. Most of our native trout are spawning in the springtime. The, the babies, come out of the gravels uh, come late winter or early spring and when they're coming out like that they're bigger than the native fish that are just coming out of the gravels when these guys are bigger so in effect they can actually out compete for food for them. after stopping for brookies we continued our hike erosion from livestock made the trail increasingly difficult to follow Backtracking several times, we made our way out of the valley and found a path up the mountain late in the evening. All right, well, we almost lost the trail down there, but we found it because some dudes left some markers and we're up like 600 feet above this ridge and about another half mile to go, 45 degrees up to the lake, but we're almost there. Carrying 60 pounds of gear up the side of the mountain proved to be no easy task, but the view in the morning was worth every grueling step. Good morning, everybody. We're at our destination. It's about 6.30 in the morning. A brisk 55 degrees, but I mean, I guess the view's all right. We woke up to a scene straight off of National Geographic. Hundreds of fish came from the depths of the glacial fed lake to rise on the surface and catch midges early morning. Even with minimal human interaction, these fish proved to be extremely nitpicky. It's about 8.30 a.m. These fish have been finicky as hell. Oh, damn, I had a hit. Oh! They've been nibbling almost every nymph I give them, but they won't quite take it. So I'm trying to figure out a fly that they will 
inhale. I mean, they've eaten a few flies, but I'm gonna try a fly I haven't tried yet, the blood midge. After changing through flies and different sizes of tippets, we eventually got a solid set on our first golden from this lake. Yep, that one. Yep. Feels good, I think. Okay. These golden trout, they're high up in the lake system. They're living in these really cold water systems where they're, the feeding, active feeding period is probably only about two to three months. Um, you got ice off that doesn't happen till like June, July, and then you know, winter hits them not come like September, October. So they have a really short growing season. So they typically don't get too big. So those, those fish were just magnificent. After hooking the first fish, the fishing remained consistent for the rest of the day. As time progressed, we consistently started hooking more and more fish. The colorings on these fish were breathtaking. It's hard to imagine how they could be so vibrant. Most fishing trips are spent trying to catch the one, but each fish we caught was as beautiful as the one before. We've caught between me and Zach probably about a dozen or so golden trout, um, up to, I think my last one was about 16 inches. Uh, it's midday now, so it's a nymphing game for leeches and uh, little nymphs, but uh, this might be the most scenic place I've ever, oh, I just missed one ever fish. The, fan, the band on this golden trout is insane. Oh my god, he's solid. Probably about, let's see, probably about 15 inches. Just pretty dang good. All right, get this. There we go. After a long day of catching goldens, we kept a couple pan fryers to cook over the fire with the seasonings we packed in. Relaxing by the fire before going to bed, we recalled the larger fish we witnessed cruising the lake and set high hopes for what we might catch the next day. In the morning, we woke up and set up both of our rods and started casting with the intention of catching some of the larger fish we saw the day before. We would only have a few hours before we needed to get back on the trail. I hadn't really fished in several years, so it took a minute to remember how to catch a fish instead of myself. But soon enough, I was able to catch a few healthy golden trout. As the day progressed, the pressure went up to catch a big fish before we needed to pack our bags and leave the lake. That one, I hooked right, right on this kite. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's a nice That's the biggest golden of the, of the entire trip, dude. That's the most immaculate fish we've caught all trip, dude. <laughs> um, this looks to be a hen, probably a few years old, uh, give or take. And this is a, she's a perfect fish. There's no flaws in, in her scales or anything. This golden was not the big one we'd hoped for, but it was the prettiest trout that either of us had ever seen. At noon, we packed up all of our gear and prepared for the hike back down the mountain to the trailhead. We hiked for the rest of the afternoon and arrived at the tundra later in the day. Starving and exhausted, we traveled just north of Bridgeport, California and set up camp to get some much needed rest. solid 10 hours of sleep, 
We made breakfast, packed our bags, and made our way to Bridgeport, California to replenish our supplies and prepare for the next big leg of our trip. How's this compared to camp food, bro? This is probably the best burger I've ever had in my life. At a burger restaurant in Bridgeport, I saw a familiar name on the map not far from town that led us on an unexpected afternoon trip to one of the largest unrestored ghost towns in America. High in the hills south of Bridgeport, California, a once bustling town lies in arrested decay. Founded in 1876, Bodie, California was once one of the largest cities in the state, with a population of approximately 8,500. Through its heyday in the late 1800s, nearly 10,000 tons of precious ore worth $15 million was excavated from the Bodie Hills. With money plentiful, crime took center stage. Robberies, stage holdups, street fights, and sometimes daily killings gave the town a reputation as the most lawless, wild, and tough mining camp in the West. Depleted mines and a series of fires left the town in a state of decline. Bodie became a ghost town in the 1940s and remained that way until its designation as a historic park. Today, the town is little more than a tourist trap and a reminder of a bygone era. Having caught Goldens on the trip, it was time for us to turn our attention to another native fish to the Sierras. So we headed north towards Carson Pass to fish for the only isolated population of Lahontan cutthroat that exists in the Truckee River. One of the cool projects that's happened in this area is the uh, reintroduction of LCT in mice meadows in the upper Truckee River. And it's a really popular recreational fishery where people can kind of come in and get some solitude, backpack in, and catch lawns in their native, uh, in their native range and catch fish that you really don't have the opportunity to catch anywhere else. After filming some of the fish in the stream, we tried fishing for little Lahontans in some of the larger pools further downstream. Plenty of little fish hit ant patterns on the sun-drenched surface of this clear water stream. So I got, just got a Lahontan cutthroat here. I did a downstream cast, put some uh, S-mens in it. Uh, took a minute for him to come up and take it, but after following for a few feet or so, I got him to take this little ant pattern. So we got about a six inch native Lahontan cutthroat in the upper Truckee River. Formerly a ranch that started in the late 1800s, Mice Meadows is a haven for stream resident Lahontan cutthroat trout. The cutthroat thrive thanks to protections on the area put in place by California Department of Fish and Wildlife and their reintroduction by the U.S. Forest Service. Soon we packed our bags and made our way back down the trail to prepare for a tour and interview at the National Lahontan Fish Hatchery Complex. Hello, my name is Kareen Jones and I'm a fish biologist and also the broodstock manager here at Lahontan National Fish Hatchery Complex. We work with the Pilot Peak strain, uh, that is what we raise here at our hatchery in Garnerville. Those are fish that were originally in Pyramid Lake and they evolved in ancient Lake Lahontan and they were extirpated by the 1940s basically for a number of reasons, overfishing, um, habitat loss, uh, loss of, of the ability to spawn and they were rediscovered in a really small creek on Pilot Peak out near the Nevada-Utah border over about a 15 year period. We brought those fish into the hatchery and developed a captive brood stock we have Pilot Peak Lahontan cutthroat trout. Normally we'll raise about, oh, somewhere between 400 and 500,000 fish to stock out for um, restoration and for recreational angling for native fish. The Pilot Peak strain is known to get to very large sizes. These are an iconic native fish. We know they at least go to 10 years old and it's likely they'll go much longer than that. And one of the other aspects is late maturity, so they don't start coming into spawn until they're five, six, seven years old. One of the things we do here um, as a conservation hatchery is stock fish out for restoration and recovery work. So we're trying to recover this native species. 
After the tour of the hatchery, we head to north to Cold Creek Campground, north of Lake Tahoe. So we just uh, pulled up to camp and there's a really neat little uh, freestone creek that uh, flows right along it. And I've seen a trout at the bottom of this pool rise and I put on an amp pattern of 4X and he wasn't taking it. So I switched to 5X and a parachute at him. So two casts later, pulled out a 12 inch brown. Well, actually not 12 inches, more like, more like nine. But I was stoked either way to catch a brown on this trip. So that makes five species. Waking up to a cool morning at Cold Creek, we prepared to meet our new friend Jason, who agreed to take us fishing for native Lahontans at Independence Lake. Uh, the unique thing about Independence Lake is it's just one of two lakes where uh, LCT reproduce naturally. And uh, it's a remnant population of LCT, so back in uh, the 50s when they were trying to put LCT in other places, basically the two lakes they had to draw from were Summit and Independence. And so, you know, being able to come up here into the High Sierra and fish for uh, a remnant population of LCT is, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, this is the only place you can do it in California. And uh, it's uh, also the only lake that we have that still has the uh, native assemblage of fishes uh, that go along with Lahan cutthroat trout. Another fish kept us entertained while the Lahontans refused to bite. Often called the poor man's bonefish, the whitefish are an underappreciated fish native to the Tahoe region. I got him, he came for it. Jump him up. Oh, it's a big whitey. Oh, he's hooked on the line. Hold on, I'm pulling him down. Yeah, pound for pound. I don't know if there's a better fight for fish in the lake. Look at this gill plate. Oh, yeah, it's a missing one. Yeah. I think that's got us from. like weird striped bass. <laughs> Though the whitefish put up a fight, they were not the reason that we came to the lake. We changed tactics seeking out cutthroat, and before long, we had our first of the lake. Here we go. Yes. That's a nice fish. I sight fished this guy. That's a nice fish. I think it's a cutty. Oh, you got it! Good job, man. Oh, damn! Finally! Woo! -hoo! Oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. Look at that fish. So these are remnant fish that have always been in. So the Independence and the Summit fish were basically the fish that are responsible for us having recreational fisheries for LCT because these were the only two lakes we ever had. So these fish are, these fish have been in this lake for a long time. Yep. There's a lot of people who will drive a long ways um, and spend a lot of money to catch a native fish. You know, with LCT you have this really strong, uh, resilient fish that can live through almost anything. They withstand warmer temperatures than rainbows and browns in most creeks. You know, so you could, you could potentially have a much greater fishery with more fish and bigger fish. And I think uh, an important part of what we're doing now is really bringing a native fish back to the places where it's always been. And we're not removing all of the non-native fisheries. We're not removing sport fisheries. We're really just bringing back something that was meant to be here and something that's special. We still have a long way to go. And uh, with the help of all of our partners and anglers who care about these fish, uh, I see it as a really good opportunity to make some progress and, and have a successful reintroduction program. Seeing these fish in their native lands, we were able to fully understand the struggles and uncertain future they face in a vastly changing world. But after meeting some of the stewards of these native species, we knew that they would remain in good hands.